Welcome uh, to the Wednesday afternoon lecture uh, with a presentation today uh, by Dr. Sandro Gallia. I'm glad that you're joining us on this uh, snowy, rainy afternoon uh, to listen to what I think is going to be a very thoughtful and relevant presentation uh, from our speaker. So uh, Dr. Gallia is currently the Robert Knox Professor and Dean at the Boston University School of Public Health. His undergraduate training at the University of Toronto, MD at the University of Toronto Medical School, and then Master of Public Health at Harvard and Doctor of Public Health at Columbia. Um, he has had medical training in emergency medicine uh, and his academic career has touched on several institutions, including uh, the Columbia University folks, the University of Michigan, uh, Columbia again, and now, as I mentioned, at Boston University uh, School of Public Health. Uh, he's received a number of important honors uh, considered by Time Magazine uh, to be one of the epidemiology innovators. He has served on the uh, advisory council for the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, for which we are grateful. Thank you for that willingness to help us with guiding our own research agenda. His scholarship has been particularly focused on the intersection of what you might call social and psychiatric epidemiology, and particularly on the behavioral health consequences of trauma. We are all going through trauma in 2020, uh, so that background fits rather well uh, for what he's going to talk to us about today. His title is The Contagion Next Time, Underlying Socioeconomic and Racial Divides and Our Risk from COVID and Future Pandemics. So with that introduction, please join me in welcoming our speaker, uh, Dr. Sandro Gallia. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. You. Collins, for that um, kind introduction. Thank you for actually saying my last name perfectly, the way my mother would say it, which is quite unusual. Um, uh, and thank you, Dr. Paris Table, an old colleague and friend who I really enjoyed um, um, being on council for uh, NIMHD for uh, several years. As uh, Dr. Collins mentioned, I'm going to talk about the contagion next time, and I'm going to talk obviously about the, co the COVID moment because that is the moment that's very much on all our minds. And I'm, I'm going to make a case for why the COVID moment cannot be seen without thinking about a social divides lens, but I think of a, a lens about health divides and the health haves and health have nots and why that matters and why that matters in this moment. And I'm going to try to do it in about 40, 45 minutes to leave time for questions. So let me start my first point. I'm going to make 10 points in this talk. Um, COVID-19, is a triumph. It's a real triumph of biomedical science. And speaking here at NIH, it seems um, not only important to say that, but I think it's important to elevate the role that the work of this community of biomedical scientists, obviously at NIH, but throughout the country and throughout the world, has played this enormous role in the context of COVID-19. I'll start by making that case. This is um, a recent paper from uh, Dr. Horowitz at, and colleagues at NYU looking at um, COVID mortality. And this, uh, the gray bars looks at admissions to the NYU system uh, for COVID. But what really matters here is the, uh, are the light blue bars. The light blue bar is adjusted mortality. And really what this paper shows quite nicely is the extraordinary drop in mortality in um, COVID after the initial uh, first cases of COVID in March and April. And the paper attributes to the, the drop in uh, mortality from COVID to improve clinical experience, growing use of pharmacological treatments, things like remdesivir, corticosteroids, better, better clinical care, things like proning, proning of patients, and potentially also lower viral loads, perhaps due to mask wearing. All of this, to my mind, is within the realm of scientific discovery. All of this is shows how science, in a very short period of time, was able to guide our handling of this unprecedented, previously unknown, disease, at least in this form, and result in really a drop, a fourfold drop in mortality in just a few months. Now, it's sort of hard to wrap our brain around that. And it's hard to think of that being as, as a big deal, simply because we've all been immersed in all COVID all the time for the past year. But it is a big deal. In a short period of time, far fewer people were dying from COVID, largely because of the work of biomedical science. And of course, the ultimate triumph in biomedical science is this is vaccination data. We now know that we have two vaccines that are being approved for FDA with EUAs um, uh, from Pfizer and from Moderna. And these vaccines represent, uh, they, they are, as we all know, going to be transformative. They are really going to change the world and how we've lived in 2020. But perhaps what's most remarkable is how these vaccines have defied all previous experience with vaccines. This is a, a simple uh, graph uh, from the, 
the uh, Wellcome Trust showing the typical vaccine development uh, course, which is typically about 10 years, um, leaving the cost aside for a second. But the previous fastest vaccine that we had delivered was four years in the case of mumps. And now we've done this in about six to eight months, which is extraordinary. And even more extraordinary, perhaps, is that this comes from the, certainly these two vaccines are new technologies. These are mRNA vaccine technologies. This is just from a paper about 10 years ago, where which says mRNA presents a promising vector may well become the basis of a game-changing vaccine technology platform, which I actually quite like because if there ever was a prediction that has come true and come true right in time for humanity, it is this context. So I do think it's important that we see COVID-19. It's hard. It's really hard to see it that way in this moment in time because we're all so immersed in it all the time and we're all, it has transformed all our lives. But really it is, it does represent a triumph of biomedical research. And I think, and I hope that it positions us all well, all of us in the scientific community, well to then build on this towards ever greater, better scholarship to improve our health and to get us ready for what I'm calling the contagion next time. So starting with a tale of triumph, I think it's fair to say, okay, well, is there a problem? So what is the challenge? What is the challenge about COVID-19? If it was a triumph of biomedical science, then why is it that has dominated our thinking so much? And why is it that I suspect no one really in the room, if I may use the Zoom as the word of the room, really feels like it has been a triumph? And I think to think about why it has been a problem, we need to understand health. I think we need to go back to basics and say, how do we understand health? And I realize there's a certain arrogance in the statement, given that I'm talking here at the National Institutes of Health, but bear with me. And really all I want to do is just structure our thinking about health and to say, what is it ultimately that generates health? And to make that case, I want to make the case by um, sharing a story of uh, this gentleman here. Uh, for those of you who are blues fans, this uh, gentleman is Blind Willie Johnson, who is one of the greats of the blues. And um, Blind Willie Johnson, was uh, born in Texas at the turn of the 20th century. He was born sighted, and the story is that uh, he lost his eyesight in a domestic violence incident when he was a child. So he grew up poor and uh, black and blind in Texas in the beginning of the 20th century. He um, got married, and when he got married, he was living in a small house, and that house burned down. And because he didn't have any money, him and his wife, they actually went back to living in the burnt out husk of the house. When he was in his 40s, this is now in the 1940s in Texas, he developed malaria. This was not so uncommon. Texas malaria in the 1940s in Texas, not so uncommon as many people here know, the CDC was initially started in, many, in no small part to help control malaria in the Southern states. And his wife took him to hospital and he was turned away from hospital. It's not clear if he was turned away because he was poor, because he was black or because he was blind. And then he died. So the reason I tell that story is to ask, what killed Blind Willie Johnson? Well, what killed Blind Willie Johnson was malaria. It's no question of what killed him was malaria. That had he received treatment for malaria, had he received, for example, the much maligned chloroquine, um, he actually would have lived. But the reason I tell that story is because it's obvious to everybody listening that it wasn't just malaria that killed Blind Willie Johnson. It was also domestic violence and racism and homelessness and poverty and poor access to care. All of those forces killed Blind Billy Johnson and had malaria not killed him the day it killed him, something else was going to kill him the next day. And when I tell that story, all, all people listening to the story intuit that the forces that shaped Blind Billy Johnson's health were not just malaria, but all these other forces around him as well, that they all ultimately produced his health. And as a result, those of us who are interested in health need to concern ourselves with this full set of forces. We need to generate scholarship that understands this full set of forces. And we need to make sure that we think about interventions and approaches that deal with this full set of forces. Thinking of this schematically, this is from uh, the um, Clinical Systems Improvement um, Institute, thinking about so what is it that causes health? This is really the blind Willie Johnson story told in the form of a cartoon. And there are many such cartoons and they all come up with percentages of elements that cause health. I'm, I'm not uh, so fussed about these percentages and I would, I would ward us away from actually getting too hung up on what the exact percent is. But fundamentally, health is caused by healthcare, by the diseases themselves, but also by health behaviors, tobacco use, diet, alcohol, sexual activity, by the physical environment which we live, by our jobs, by our education, by our social supports, by our income, by our community, by our communities. All of these forces fundamentally shape health. The question, I don't think I'm saying anything controversial. The question is, 
do we understand this and do we invest accordingly? If this is correct, is how we deal with health commensurate with what actually shapes health? And I would argue that it's actually not the case. On the left, this is again a stylized cartoon, the same cartoon I showed you before, uh, really the same percentages I showed you before, physical environment, medicine, health behavior, socioeconomic factors, and what causes health. And on the right is what we spend our money on health. And we spend our money overwhelmingly on the medical side of the house. And to go back to the Willie Johnson story, effectively, we spend all our money on malaria. So if we, malaria by way of metaphor, of course, so if we saw blind Willie Johnson's case as strictly a case of malaria, then we would be spending our money correctly. Because if we can fix malaria only, and we take care of everything else, then we're doing the right job. But 90% of our expenditures really are about the treatment side of the house. Now, that is, by the way, 90% of a lot of money, because we spend a lot of money on our health. This is uh, this uh, greenish line, I don't know what color this is, is uh, shows our health expenditures. Um, the other colorful lines are other high income countries. Everybody's spending more on health. We are spending more and more faster than everybody else. Essentially, our second derivative, our rate of change is faster than anybody else. And so we're spending more and more on health, and we're spending more and more on that aspect of malaria. And just to make that case, this looks at our spending. The um, blue is our spending in health and healthcare. The light blue, Social Security is the dark blue, staying roughly the same. But look at all other spending getting more and more constricted. Now, as uh, Dr. Collins mentioned in his introduction, right now I have the privilege of serving as Dean of School of Public Health in Boston, um, which means I'm situated in Massachusetts. And uh, Massachusetts is, considers itself uh, one of the most progressive of states. And um, sometimes I give this talk in Massachusetts or something like it, and somebody says, well, that may be the case all over the country or maybe in some southern states, but it's not really the case in a place like Massachusetts where we are progressive and open-minded. So I looked at, at uh, Massachusetts budget, and this is a uh, um, spending over 15 year period in Massachusetts. And what you see is a 100% increase in healthcare, again, in the malaria treatment side of the house, and more or less staying the same or less on things like transportation, housing, primary, second education, law enforcement, public safety, mental health, higher education, early childhood care, public health, environmental recreation, all of that is staying the same or going down. And these numbers are true everywhere. They really are true everywhere. And we have paid a price for that. And we as a country pay a price for that. And I could go on and on, show you data as to how we pay the price on that. But most notably, perhaps just by way of um, summarizing this simply is in our life expectancy. We as a country, um, we are the red line here, all the other sort of high income countries are these colorful lines. We broadly speaking, leave about five years on the table in the context of life expectancy. We choose to die four to five years sooner than other countries. Now, one could make an argument that rational people can make the choice. Rational people can choose to have lower life expectancy because we choose other values. And that, that may be the case. I would argue that actually we do not consciously choose that because we do not understand this. We do not engage intellectually and honestly with the trade-offs that we are making and leaving four to five years on the table because we are choosing to invest only in malaria, in the treatment of malaria, not in the other forces. And of course, hopefully you're all now starting to connect the dots together. I'm here talking about COVID and talking about these underlying forces and how they relate to COVID. And I started off by saying, that COVID is a triumph of biomedical research because we are actually having vaccine and treatment for COVID. So in the context of Blind Willie Johnson, it's a triumph of research as applied to his malaria. But I'm here to illustrate how the other forces are ineluctable. And it doesn't matter how good we are at treating malaria, it's never enough. And it doesn't matter how good it is we are at treating the other forces in um, around COVID, the other forces around us hold us back and structure fundamentally our health outcomes due to the disease around us. That fundamentally, we cannot get away from the role of forces like education, nutrition, parks, opportunity for recreation, poverty and income, housing, isolation, loneliness, and forces like the environment. That these forces all need to be kept in mind if we are to think about how we create healthier populations. And I would argue that in the context of a talk at the National Institutes of Health, this is fundamentally what we should be thinking about. We should be thinking about health and all the forces that generate health. Perhaps my one favorite slide, which captures the discrepancy in our country between our spending and what we achieve for health is this slide. The x-axis looks at our spending. The y-axis is life expectancy. And what you see here is all these countries, you spend more, you get more life expectancy. That seems rational, but you see us where we spend more and we sort of fall off the curve in life expectancy. We're a little bit like a, 
like a classic growth curve for children, for any of you who do developmental type work, where we essentially are failing to thrive, where we fall off the curve. And fundamentally, that is because we underinvest in the forces that generate health that are not the clinical, therapeutic, curative forces that are important, but really just one part of the puzzle. So that's by way of background. Now, compounding this is the fact that these forces are maldistributed. Compounding this is the fact that the forces that I'm talking about that generate health are distributed in ways that are uneven broadly along two axes, along socioeconomic axes and along racial axes. And that as they are maldistributed, the health, their health consequences are maldistributed. And what we saw in COVID was in many respects, nothing new. It actually was a dramatic expression of what was there before, what had been there for decades, and elevating for all to see these underlying divides in how the resources to generate health are distributed. Let me start with the obvious. Perhaps the most obvious is income. I'll start with income. And what this looks at is income by quintiles in the country. And what you see here is that the income of the richest quintile has grown over the past 30 years, 40 years, which you wanted to grow. We will want all our incomes to grow. Income for everybody else in the poorest 80% essentially has not budged that much. I say that and I say, isn't that extraordinary? And it's extraordinary because the, the, to have 80% of the country not actually budge in the one, what is the fundamental resource that generates our well-being is really quite remarkable. And to say that only 20% are actually budging, and I could spend a lot more time on that, but I won't. But simply to illustrate this divide between the 20% and the 8%, I'm going to come back to that, because this divide, to my mind, characterizes the fundamental divide between the distribution of those resources that fundamentally shape health. Now, when I talk about socioeconomic resources, I said socioeconomic resources and race, ethnicity, the two are deeply intertwined. It's really impossible to separate them. This now looks at um, um, uh, weekly earnings by, by degree and by race. And I simply, I want to just show you here that this is people with bachelor's degree who are white and people with bachelor's degree who are black to show the, the, the gap, the amazing gap that's built in to wages um, by race comparing white and black. And if I were to just here take the income again, this is white families overall and black families overall, the gap in income pales by comparison with the gap in wealth that's on the right. The gap in wealth, which is um, essentially tenfold between white families and black families, which of course underlies and is a pattern and reflection of the long time marginalization of minority Americans, particularly black Americans who have long not had access to wealth and the resources. And if one buys the story that fundamentally these resources are protective of health, that these resources generate health. In other words, if you understand and intuitively understand the blind Willie Johnson story is important for us under understanding of health, you realize that we are actually structuring a world where those resources that generate health are maldistributed and where one group, in this case, I'm looking at black Americans, are at tremendously greater risk of poor health simply because they don't have these resources. And this is actually patterned at all levels. This is, I wanna show you worth um, uh, um, a household net worth, which is essentially um, wealth by race and education. On the left is white, which is the blue and black is red. And you see that at all levels of college, post-college, college, some college, the white black wealth gap is quite large. It's really, it's about a um, uh, five fold the difference between wealth gap and white versus black at, uh, by different uh, levels of college. And uh, this is by different levels of household income. So at different levels of income, you have different wealth, income of more than $121,000, you have a, uh, about, a, a, about a three and a half fold increase between white and black wealth. Now, what's amazing about this is, yes, it's amazing that it exists, but it's perhaps more amazing that not only does it exist, but it is actually getting worse, that we as a country allowing this to get worse. So I want to show you this. This is um, looking at uh, 1983 and uh, 2016. This is all wealth in the country. This is a little bit down between over the past, there's a 40 year period essentially. Look at white going up, black essentially staying the same going down, Latinx staying the same, maybe a little bit going up. So this discrepancy in the availability of the resources that generate health is there it creates divides and those divides are widening. So I feel like anybody who's interested in health at this point has to say to themselves, you either have to say, I don't believe the blind Willie Johnson story. You have to say, 
That's nonsense. All we should do is focus on malaria. Or if you don't say that, and I think that's a, that's a discussion we can have, we can have the discussion. But if you don't say that, you then have to say these other forces matter and they matter. And the fact that they are so divided sets us up for failure because it doesn't matter how much we do for malaria. If those resources are maldistributed, different groups are going to have worse health. And a lot of that maldistribution goes back centuries. It goes back centuries, it goes back to forces like slavery. This, for example, is a map of slavery in the Southern United States showing the denser colors um, being areas where there were more black slaves. And that ultimately set up a history of disenfranchisement, which resulted in the maldistribution of resources that pers persist to this very day. Slavery set up patterns of redlining, redlining, which was discrimination about where people of different racial groups could live. Um, this is a picture of Detroit showing the red areas where areas where the um, homeowners loan corporation, which actually was a federal corporation that was ironically enough established to help people buy homes, but to took it upon themselves to create red lines to essentially show lenders areas where they should not lend, which were essentially areas where predominantly minority residents. And those, that has resulted in the patterns that we have today, for example, patterns of segregation. This is again Detroit, Eight Mile Road is in the middle, as um, Dr. Collins mentioned. I spent some time at the University of Michigan, as also did Dr. Collins. Um, uh, and uh, this is uh, from a study which um, took people by, uh, from the census, individuals, green dots, blue dots, white Americans, black Americans, showing this extraordinary segregation, right? You cross Eight Mile Road and you go white, black. It's extraordinary segregation, which really is patterned on our historical, on our historical legacy of disenfranchising particular groups. Now, that may be interesting, perhaps, and it may also be interesting sort of sociologically. I think it's not unreasonable for you to say, okay, well, that's nice, but we're ultimately national students of health. We are about health. Well, that may be interesting. It may be important for how we structure society. It doesn't really matter to us so much unless it affects health. So really the question is, what are the health divides that are consequent to these social divides. Because I do think there's a fair argument to be made that says, okay, Sandra, well, that's fine. And we can talk about that. We can talk about whether that's right, how our society is structured, but we ultimately care about health. So does this map onto our health? And the answer is yes, it does. The answer is yes, it does. And we can start at simple things like life expectancy. This is white life expectancy, black life expectancy, showing a persistent, although slightly narrowing four year increase in life expectancy. Although in the context of COVID, some of that's reversing, which I'll get to in a second. But let me go back to the um, picture of slavery I showed you before. This is the same map of slavery that I showed you before, um, only now it's rendered in GIS. It's exactly the same map. You see the same density in the same area. And that, of course, maps directly on the stroke belt in the Southern US. And the legacy of slavery, in many respects, casts a long shadow. It, is, it, is, it maps onto where we have higher density of strokes today. And I could go on and on. I could show you um, 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 mortality rates by uh, Again, black versus white, showing greater mortality rate at different ages, young ages, middle ages, older ages. Different patterns of risk factor, again, higher from a black American versus white Americans, young ages, middle ages, older ages, high blood pressure and diabetes. And I could actually tie the various pictures of marginalization and, and unevenness of distribution of social resources to health directly. So this slide actually shows on the left is a picture of redlining in Detroit. That's the map I showed you before. Now it's rendered in GIS. In the middle is foreclosure during the, 20, the 2008 recession. And what you see is where areas were redlined, there's more foreclosure. And on the right is poor health. And the areas that are on the right that are darker are the areas where there was foreclosure, which is the areas where there was redlining decades ago, showing the long footprint of this maldistribution of resources. Let me go back to income for a second. I go back to income. Remember I showed 20, 80%, 20% population has higher income. Well, the 20% population with higher income also is the 20% of the population with better health and increasingly better health. These are a variety of uh, heart disease um, uh, metrics just from people recently published in JAMA are grouped it and looking at the blue as the richest 20%, the orange is the poorest 80%. What you see is lower CHF, heart attack, stroke, et cetera, among 20% versus 80%. That may not surprise you, but what is perhaps surprising is that that gap is widening. Look at angina prevalence, poorest 80%, richest 20%. Heart attack, poorest 80%, richest 20%, that gap is widening. And that gap is widening a whole a, 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 along all risk factors for heart disease, CHF, angina, heart attack, stroke. Um, uh, again, the yellow, uh, I apologize, the green is the richest 20%, the yellow is the poorest 80%. This is uh, 
20 years ago, this is five years ago, what you see is there was a gap 20 years ago, there's a wider gap now. Angina, there was no gap 20 years ago, there's a wide gap now, heart attack little gap, bigger gap now, etc. So all of this is widening that the 20%, 80% gap is growing and it is constructing essentially the patterns for how our society generates health. And by the way, the 20%, 80% gap roughly reflects the population with a four-year college degree, which is about 25%. Now, that was income and race. And I just wanna show you one slide that brings income and race together, because while I talk about them separately for the sake of actually explicating it, they do happen at the same time, they do happen together. So I think this graph brings them together quite nicely. This looks at four different conditions, but just focus in the middle, just focus on asthma with me. So this is census tracts across the country. And what you see here is this is more income by census tract. And let's take prevalence of asthma. So what I want you to see here is as you have more income, you can draw a best fit line here to this cloud of census tracts that goes down this way, which means the higher the income, less asthma. It's not surprising. But what this, what this graph does nicely is it then colors in the census tract purple by the greater share of black population. And what you see here is the black census tracts are the ones that are clustered with lower income, high prevalence of asthma. So there are socioeconomic divides, there are racial divides, and the two come together to create a pattern of limited access to resources that ultimately generate health that are ineluctably linked to the actual pathophysiology that results in diseases like, meat, like, like uh, malaria, as I showed you earlier, or as I'm gonna show you now, COVID. So let's now move to COVID. Let's move to the COVID moment. So we are living the COVID moment. We are living the COVID moment. This is just, um, I, I finalized these slides over the weekend. This is the map of currently where we are on COVID. This is um, the map of the COVID epidemic curve. I don't need to tell you all this. And of course, COVID has resulted in extraordinary efforts at mitigation. This is a picture of Times Square, an empty Times Square. I spent several years living in New York City and can attest to how unusual that is. And the, those efforts at mitigation have resulted in extraordinary economic consequences. This is the uh, um, uh, drop in employment among Americans, which really we've um, dropped employment to the lowest level we've had since 1975 um, from Labor Department data. But these patterns of mitigation, the results of this mitigation has been deeply uneven. And it shouldn't be a surprise at this point that those patterns of mitigation reflect the underlying patterns of resource haves and resource have nots. And ultimately those resource haves and resource have nots shape our health. This, is, this looks at um, share of um, uh, unemployment. And what, what you see here is that while overall our um, unemployment for high wages, that's essentially all of us on this call, really hasn't gone down anymore. It's really back to normal. But you look at low wages, at low wage workers, and that is still 20% lower than it was. I can show you the same thing by race. This uh, looks at uh, um, Hispanic Americans had the steepest initial employment loss, and they have most time, to, uh, most ground to make up. And white Americans overall have recovered more than half their jobs, while black Americans have recovered only about a third of their jobs. So the the loss of resources, resources that were already poorly distributed, is now being deepened by the result to the COVID pandemic. And of course, that is also linked to um, race and across all levels of educational attainment. This looks at unemployment, black, um, uh, Latino, and white, showing that, look at less than high school diploma just for a second, that there's higher un uh, unemployment for all, of the, all those groups, but more for black, more than Latino, and more for white. And perhaps what's most heartbreaking about this is that it didn't have to be like this, and it hasn't been like this in prior recessions. This is um, 1990 recession, 2001, 2008 coronavirus recession. What you see is the different job losses and look at the coronavirus, look at 2008. There was some stratification, but look at the coronavirus, the highest earning 25% versus lowest earning, the immense stratification that followed, that is following the COVID recession. So this is a moment in time that has laid bare these underlying inequities and has really elevated them to our consciousness. And I think all of us in health and all over the world should be aware of this. And of course, it is then not a surprise that the while we were going the national trauma of COVID, while we're undergoing the national trauma, to use Dr. Collins's word, of um, the economic consequence of COVID, we also went through the national trauma and are going through together of the most profound civil unrest in 50 years driven by racial concerns. Of course, all of this um, emerged after the killing of unarmed Black men and women. But really, it wasn't only about that. It was about these underlying conditions that have been so socially stratified that COVID made so abundantly. 
So let's go to COVID now. Let's go to the health device that have emerged in the time of COVID. Let's go to how the Blind Willie Johnson story translated pretty directly to a time of COVID. About 50,000 Black Americans have died from COVID to date. Some Amer Black Americans have about 13% of the US population, but there are about 19% of deaths um, were race as quantified. Simply put, Black Americans die about two times the rate of uh, white Americans. There are higher uh, death rates about American Indian Latino, uh, American Indian Alaska Natives, Latinos, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, but I'm just going to focus on Black Americans just for the sake of uh, simplicity in this talk. What I find most remarkable is this, that um, assuming COVID happened, assuming COVID happened, but just making the simple assumption that Black Americans died at the same rate of white Americans, about 20,000 more Black Americans would still be alive, as simple as that. And by the way, another 10,000 Latino Americans will still be alive. This is not saying there is no COVID. They're saying there's still COVID. It's just everybody dies at the same rate. We still have 20,000 Black people, 10,000 Latino people still alive today, which is quite remarkable. Now, when we talk about death in the context of COVID, I think it's important to start breaking that down a little bit, to start breaking down what do we mean by death and COVID? What do we mean by more COVID in particular groups? And how does that, how is that linked to these underlying patterns of loss of socioeconomic conditions that create health that I'm talking about before. And I'm going to address that by looking at this graph. This looks at DC, Illinois, Michigan, Tennessee, Wisconsin. They all behave the same way. Let's just focus on the uh, District of Columbia, which is close to where you all are. And all I want you to look at is black versus white. And there are three graphs. The blue graph is the percent of population. The orange graph is the percent of COVID cases. And the gray graph is percent of COVID deaths. What you see among blacks is more COVID cases than there are population and more deaths than there, is than there are COVID cases. Conversely, among white, fewer cases than there is population and fewer deaths than there are cases. Now, what's that mean? That means there are two sets of risk factors. There are risk factors that take us from being in a population to getting COVID, and there are risk factors that go from getting COVID to dying from COVID. And the two sets of risk factors are coinciding to create the pattern that I showed you earlier of greater death among black Americans compared to white Americans. And that really matters because that matters to us understanding about what are the forces around all of us that generate greater risk for getting the disease. And when you get the disease to have more severe outcomes. So I wanna get into that, but before I do, I just wanna pause for a second and say, while I'm here talking about the US, I'm talking about the US because with National Institutes of Health, we are in this country, from some of us, it's an adopted country, but it is our country that, uh, that we are focusing on is appropriate. But this patterning, this patterning of disadvantage that becomes patterning by health is not unique to us at all. And I do think we want to recognize that, that in many respects, it is as fundamental a law of population health science as our, as our rules about blood pressure and uh, cholesterol associated with heart disease. And just to give you an example of that, this comes from the UK. This looks at the first wave of their pandemic. This is the classic epidemic curve. And all I want you to see is number of COVID cases. They separate things by quintile here. Um, this is the richest, uh, this is the poorest quintile and richest quintile. You see, everybody behaves the same way. The pandemic curve behaves the same way. But if you're poorer, you're in the top, in the higher part of the, of the curve. If you're richer, you're in the lower part of the curve. That's in cases, similarly in deaths. Same thing exactly, lowest quintile, best quintile. So this is a, a universal observation of population health science. There's nothing particular to our country about it, but I think of course our country has a particular relationship to these underlying conditions. And it's one that I think we have a responsibility to address. So let's bring it all together. Let me talk about health haves, health have nots and COVID-19. So why this patterning? Why this patterning of um, by race around the context of COVID? Well, one can say, well, maybe there's something intrinsic, something genetic, or there's something about our treatment of people with COVID-19. Remember I showed you earlier about triangle treatment. That is not the case. And it's, it's, and we know that's not the case. It's a paper that just came from Dr. Ogedekbe's uh, group also at NYU, it turns out, where they look at the um, at death of patients by race once people are admitted to hospital. All I want you to look at here is this. Very, very simply, you see this black and Hispanic right here, no significant p-value, that once you're in hospital, there really is no difference in mortality, which is good. This is good. That actually means that within our health system, we do not have this systematic differential treatment. It also means that there's nothing intrinsic about being black, being Latino, being white, that is killing you, making you more likely to die once you're in hospital. No, it clearly means that our risks for greater death for minority groups reflects the greater risk for acquiring COVID and greater risk from dying from COVID most of the time in the community. So what are the greater risks for acquiring COVID? Well, COVID is acquired through contact. COVID is acquired through contact. 
through being inside close spaces together, not being able to isolate, not being able to work from home. And those resources are entirely socially patterned. This is from a paper that our group did, um, which came out in uh, Nature Human Behavior, um, or actually is just about to come out, very simply looking at um, smartphone users staying home all day and smartphone uh, users who are able to work outside the home. It's actually very, very simple that uh, the, uh, the richer you are, the more likely you are to be able to stay home. And the richer you are, the more likely, um, less likely you are to be working outside the home. That, of course, is maps on directly and ability to work remotely by income quintile. This is this is like it's a perfect dose response relationship. This is from labor statistics data that uh, top quartile of income, you're more likely to work at home, lower quartile, you're not likely to work at home. This right there is the central explanation for why you're more likely to get COVID if you are if you do not have the resources that ultimately protect your health in general. And COVID, as I said about 10 minutes ago, in some respects, there's nothing special about COVID. COVID is behaving like a full range of many other diseases. I could have given the first half of this talk five years ago, 10 years ago. COVID simply illustrates that much more clearly than we have ever seen it. And hopefully we are now seeing it clearly. So this is a bill to work in multi income quintile. And this is likely to be working in an essential industry. If you're black, you're much more likely to work in an essential industry than other racial groups. I like this graph. This graph actually is from the UK, making this case quite clearly. This is income decile. This is a higher income decile here on the x-axis. And uh, what you have is look at the yellow is having diagnosis with illness makes you vulnerable to COVID. So now I'm going to switch to not just getting COVID, but getting sick with COVID. And what you see is when if you're higher income decile, you are less likely to have underlying conditions. And if you're higher income decile, you're less likely to have underlying mental health conditions, which make you more likely to have um, and we know underlying mental health conditions make you more likely to have poor mental health in the context of COVID. So we've seen what makes you more likely to get COVID. And now what makes you more likely to become sick from COVID, what makes you more likely to get sick from COVID is being vulnerable to COVID. Because we know, this is from the early Chinese data, the death rate for people with underlying conditions is much higher than those without. In fact, people with, without underlying conditions are quite unlikely to die from COVID. You are much more likely to die from COVID if you have underlying conditions. And I've already showed you how those, that underlying patterning results in a greater burden of these underlying conditions among Black Americans, Latino Americans, than it is among white Americans, or among Americans with lower socioeconomic resources versus those with high socioeconomic resources, among the poorest 80% versus the richest 20%. This is data from China, this is data from the US, and this shows by race and by income, I'll just focus on by income, showing that um, at every age group, the higher income you have, the fewer risk factors you have. That, of course, is what has translated into this enormous gap in deaths by COVID. And in fact, that gap is wider at younger age groups than it is at older age groups. White here is blue, and the orange is uh, black, and the gray is Latino. What you see is that the white, black, white, Latino gap is much wider at younger ages than at older ages. And the reason is very simple. is because when we get to older ages, we are now equilibrating. We are all asymptoting. We are all moving to the mean in terms of underlying morbidity, underlying risk of getting COVID at the younger ages these two sentinel risks, risk of getting COVID and risk of dying from COVID is much brighter and much more clear and results in much wider disparity. And even on consequence of COVID that are not that, things like mental health, we see this divide. This is from paper we published in JAMA a few, uh, couple of months ago, looking at the increase in um, depression, which is about threefold increase in depression over what it was at baseline. The uh, blue is, is pre-COVID, the red is during COVID. You see no, no symptoms has gone down mild, moderate, more or less severe, severe symptoms has gone up. But most importantly for the sake of this presentation is who is more likely to have depression. And when we st stratify the sample, you see that groups with low assets, the group, in other words, who do not have the resources to protect their health before COVID and high stressors. Now the group that is worried about income, job loss, looking after their family, they have four times the prevalence of depression than the groups with high assets and low stressors. So the picture to my mind is very clear. This underlying picture of socioeconomic and racial divides that has shaped our health before COVID, COVID hit and found us as sitting ducks. Essentially became sitting ducks for the expression of that underlying divide, of the underlying health haves and health have nots that became deeper health haves and health have nots in the time of COVID. Now, as I start to wind down, I want to talk about a couple of other things. I would, I would like to just move to a couple of long view pictures about COVID because I'm talking about COVID, but I do want to talk about other forces that are shaping our health in a time of COVID that we cannot forget, that are also going to be socially patterned, that ultimately, I think, depend on us in the health community to think about, to study so that we can mitigate. First of all, 
is excess mortality from other causes. You've all read about this. Uh, this looks at uh, strokes, Alzheimer's, diabetes, hypertension. This looks by month. And uh, the dark blue line is average in the preceding five years. And the bars are what's been happening in COVID times that we have higher mortality in COVID times than we've had any time in the previous five years. And there's many reasons for this. But we are going to have this pattern, this socioeconomically, racially, ethnically pattern, excess mortality that's far going to exceed the socioeconomic, ethnically pattern burden of COVID differential mortality. I've also talked quite a bit about the excess mortality because of Black, Latinx compared to white. But I do want to make the point, and this is made very well by uh, Dr. Wrigley Field in a recent paper in PNAS, about how that patterning of disparity exists and has existed for a long time. This is a uh, mortality over time and this life expectancy over time, black versus white. Black is light blue and white is dark blue. What you see is all our mortality is going down, but black has been consistently higher than white. And look at life expectancy, it's going up slowly. White consistently greater than black. By the way, this dip in life expectancy was 1918, the 1918 pandemic, which we're now gonna have. But what's really good about this paper is that Dr. Rickle Field goes on to then quantify how many deaths that means. What is the excess mortality? And, and it, the bottom line is this, that the excess differential mortality due to these underlying inequities, due to the social patterning of resources resulting in health haves, health have nots, is substantially greater than the magnitude of the differences that we're seeing in the time of COVID. Now that makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense because while COVID has been, has galvanized our world, COVID is nowhere near as bad as frankly it could have been, or as big a contribution to mortality as sometimes we think it is. First of all, just make the case about how COVID is not as bad as it could have been. This is a um, a case fatality from COVID compared to other viruses like Marburg, Nipah, et cetera, to think how bad it could have been. Um, but this prefaces the notion of contagion next time. But this is deaths. This is deaths from COVID. When this was done, it was 225. But, and this was, as of November, 2.5 million Americans died from all causes. Essentially, about 2.9 million Americans die every year. So COVID, no matter how bad it is, is really, and this is where lucky it's the case, but it is really still a small fraction of those deaths. And those deaths are all patterned by the same underlying resources, by the same disproportionate burden of resources that I'm talking about in the context of COVID. And these gaps are amplified and magnified through the full range of health conditions that we, all of us in the health community care about, that, that the National Institutes of Health is the world's premier uh, research institutes that studies all these forces. These forces I'm talking about pervade and influence everything else that we study, and COVID is simply revealing them. One last point about COVID is uh, education, because I do think that this is going to be one of the, sadly, the longest tail consequences of what's going on with COVID. This looks at um, scores. This is the Rush unit scale scores, looking at different grades. And what you see is winter 19, fall 19 in red, winter 20, fall 20. You see this is a classic population curve shift. Essentially, all our kids are doing worse. They're all doing worse, but they're not doing worse at the same rate. This is um, looks at the, the dark uh, dot is, is schools with more than half uh, students of color, and this the other one is schools with uh, with uh, more than half white students. And what you see is that schools with more students of color are falling behind about ten points, um, ten percentage points less than uh, than our other schools. This looks at online participation. Yes, we're doing online online participation, but online participation is. Uh, about 15% about lower among low-income kids, while it is essentially back to normal for high-income kids. And we know, we know, much of this from data actually that has been sponsored by National Institutes of Health, that educational attainment is perhaps the single greatest predictor, that together with income, of long-term mortality, long-term health. This looks at um, uh, uh, Latinos, Blacks, Whites, and uh, this looks at, at years of education. For all groups, the more education you have, the lower your mortality rate. So it, it's actually very simple that as we ultimately are affecting educational achievement, as we're creating wider educational gaps, we are going to be creating morbidity and mortality gaps. In a paper that also came out in JAMA recently, they did this calculation, which actually they calculated that the, the effect, the health effects of school closures in the long term are going to dwarf the net COVID effects, the net COVID benefits of school closures at the time. So let me wind down. I want to say two, two things about the role of science and I'll conclude because then I would like to take questions. Um, I could give a whole other talk about the role of science in this time. Uh, so I, I'm not going to do that. Um, I've done some writing about that, but I do think that all of us in science have a responsibility at this time to say, what are the force, what, what have we contributed? What have we done 
to help in this moment. This has been a moment of, and, and I insist on that as I started at the beginning, it's a biomedical triumph, but what has science done and how can science do better and be better? I think there are many things that we actually need to think about in context of science. I think we need to think about how we have behaved in the context of an emergency, when does something like COVID stop being an emergency? I think we have to think about our role in extreme predictions that have helped polarize the public conversation, about our role in sort of what I call here epistemic arrogance, about us, the, the certitude that has, been, uh, that has been expressed in many areas of science about what is going to happen that has polarized the country and has contributed to polarization of the country, and ultimately about our role in thinking through carefully mitigation efforts and the mitigation efforts that we can responsibly and should responsibly advocate for. If anybody's interested, I've written a bit about this. This is actually from a paper recently published in British Medical Journal, um, talking about different ways for thinking about mitigation efforts that can actually minimize some of these harms I'm talking about here. So let me conclude. This is my 10th point, and I want to conclude with the contagion next time. I've already showed you the slide that made the point about how fortunate we are in some respects that um, um, COVID is COVID. It wasn't Marburg, it wasn't Nipah. But something else will happen. We all know that. This is, um, we keep saying this is the pandemic of a, of a generation, a pandemic of a lifetime. And I think we say that, I've said that a million times. And I say that because I need to believe that because frankly, it's been a long year for me, for all of you. And I really can't handle the thought that I'm gonna go through that again anytime soon. But we know that other pandemics will happen. And my worry, and I'll tell you my worry now, my worry is that what we are going to take from this moment is number one of my 10 points, that this is a moment of biomedical triumph. It is true it's a moment of biomedical triumph and we should take that and I think we should walk, we should stand tall about that. But that in and of itself is not enough. What we should take from this is the fact that we should structure our thinking about what generates health to avoid the same patterning and the same undue burden of COVID that happened because of how we were structured because of our generation of health that long preceded COVID. I call this the contagion next time out of an homage to James Baldwin's book, The Fire Next Time. For those of you who've read it, The uh, Fire Next Time is a really, it's a searing book about the, the central role of racism in our society. And I, I, I see racism as one of several forces that ultimately shape the structure of our world that ultimately shape our health. So I, 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 my goal here is to get us to think about the contagion next time, to think about how we mitigate the contagion next time. You know, we knew another pandemic was coming. This is 2017, Time Magazine. Um, um, we're not ready for the next pandemic. They were right, we're not ready for the next pandemic. And Time Magazine is a fairly conservative publication that is, uh, um, represents, I think, a sort of fairly broad middle of the road consensus opinion. Uh, and what, what is remarkable about this issue was that um, it talked about the science that we needed in, for understanding and being ready for the pandemic next time. But, but the use of the word science was a narrowly construed use of the word science that really focused on my point one out of my 10 points, very much on biomedical science of detection, of screening, of vaccine development. And all of that's critically important, but all of that ultimately is one level of treatment of malaria for blind Willie Johnson, ignoring all the other forces that are inextricably linked to the consequences of this pandemic and the future pandemic. So I want to end here. This is my last slide. Um, um, I want to end with a slide about um, Sports, because sports brings many of us joy. I only care about one sport, um, soccer. And I'm very fortunate to be living in this country, which has the world's best soccer team, which is the US Women's National Soccer Team. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, showing you this picture to explain how soccer works for any of you who are unfortunate enough not to follow soccer. But broadly speaking, soccer is played by 11 people, one side on the field and the other side of the field. And they have to put the ball into the net on the other side. It's very simple. You just take the ball and get it into the other net. 10 players, these are the women in white, can only use their feet, hence the sport should be called football, appropriately. One woman, the woman in black, that's Alyssa Nair, she's the goalkeeper, she can use her arms, she can use her whole body to stop the ball. Remember, if nobody scores on you, you'll never lose a game. So if you don't know soccer, you can say, huh, well, thinking that way, there's 11 players, a lot of players, let me focus on investing all my money in the goalkeeper. Because if I have the world's possible goalkeeper, if she can stop every ball, I'm never going to lose a game. And that is true. But if you watch a professional soccer game, you'll see what the goalkeeper does. She is pacing her area. She's prowling constantly. And she's yelling at her fellow players. You know what she's yelling at them? She's saying to them, keep the ball away from me. Because the net is very big. And any good goalkeeper knows that if the ball comes at her strongly enough, she's going to lose the ball. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because the goalkeeper is biomedical research focused on cure and treatment. 
It is treatment of malaria and consider when blind Bill Johnson. It is the vaccine for and treatment for COVID. We need that. We need the world's best goalkeeper and having the world's premier health research institute in the NIH, we should have the world's best goalkeeper. But the best goalkeeper by herself is not going to win the game. To win the game, we need the other 10 players. And those other 10 players are our investment in education, urban environment, in fair wages, in gender equity, in environmental conditions, in where we eat, where we in, in the food we eat, the water we drink, in the conditions of where we work, where we live and where we play. And those are also conditions that generate health. Those are also conditions that should be subject of our scholarship. And those are also conditions that we should invest in to create a healthier world and to mitigate the, the consequences of the contagion next time. I will stop there and I will stop sharing and I'm delighted to take questions. Thank you again for inviting me. Eliseo, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. That was magnificent. Uh, I, I just learned so much from you every time and your 10 points uh, are always different. So, but you end, always end with soccer, which is great with football. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I appreciate that uh, analogy. So we have a number of questions that came in on the chat. I'll, I'll read the first one that came in. Uh, do other countries intentionally invest in social determinants of health? Or is there some reason the US does not value investing in the social determinants of health for some cultural reason? And I assume we mean uh, other high income countries with the resources. So. Yeah, I, there, there's a real heterogeneity in that. There are countries that invest um, more and countries that invest less. And I, I think the reasons are um, pretty complicated. I actually think that we have had a narrative for a long time where we have focused on, just to keep extending my metaphor, on malaria, just to focus on, on treatment and cure. And I think we have not wrapped our brain around thinking about the fullness of the production of health. And I think fundamentally, we need a shift in the conversation. And I think we need a shift in the conversation that comes from that science plays a role in generating. Slowly, this will change. We are already far more ahead than we have been. And, and, and I don't want to end on a negative note on pessimism. I actually think we're much better today at understanding this than we were five years ago, than we were 10 years ago. So we are in a better place. The question is, can we now use this moment to learn and do even better? Anna? Dr. Galen, Alanopoulos, uh, Scientific Director at NIMHD. Nice to see Hello, you. Anna. Great talk. Uh, so I'm going to combine two questions because they have, they have to do with the indicators that are used in this type of research. The first one has to do with uh, the difference between wealth and income. And I'd also probably add, um, from my perspective, is in terms of predicting health outcomes, is there one that's preferred or do they tell you different things? And then the second one is about how low and high stressors were measured in the study that looked at the risk of depression and assets, interaction with assets. So the answer to the first question is, there is no question that there are conditions that are much more sensitive, health conditions, that are much more sensitive to social and economic circumstance. And those fall squarely in the sort of behavioral health realm. So mental health, common mood anxiety disorders, substance use, um, uh, th those conditions vary quite quickly with changing socioeconomic conditions. In fact, I, I've written a series of papers on this about conditions that are more vulnerable to socioeconomic conditions. The conditions that are least vulnerable are conditions with the longest induction period that have the strongest genetic component, so things like pancreatic cancer. So there is a spectrum as to what's more vulnerable socioeconomic conditions. And that's question one. And question two, remind me what question two was? Was low versus high stressors? Oh, that's yeah. Um, yeah, so, so there, was, there was a list of uh, 14 stressors, which comes from fairly standard stressor scales. If anybody's interested, you can email me. I'm happy to share that. Okay. Thank you. So here's um, uh, a, a question. Uh, are you still there? Oh, yeah. Um, so do you think healthcare system focuses on malaria? Or in other words, do we focus on, on the uh, goalkeeper or the, uh, the treatment side of the healthcare of, of health and healthcare because of the profit motive for intervention? Um, is, there, is this a, a rationale for the US disproportionately uh, spending on healthcare and, and not investing a similar proportion on health, on the, on the kinds of things that lead to better health? Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. I think the answer is 
you know, the answer is yes, <laughs> because, and, and, and I don't mean that um, glibly, and I think, yes, I think the profit motive does matter. Fundamentally, right, we have built our systems, our systems of scholarship, our systems of intervention, our systems of providing care around a model that centers on cure and treatment. We, we have built a system to tend to the goalkeeper, right? And, and, and when you have that system, then all of a sudden you have a lot of forces that generate inertia that, uh, that promote looking after the goalkeeper. If I may just extend an analogy is once you say the goalkeeper is what matters most, right? You're going to make sure all your trainers are looking after the goalkeeper. You, you're, going to create, you, you're going to create your own training ground for the goalkeeper. You're going to focus on goalkeeper and you're going to let the other 10 players, you're going to give them ham and cheese sandwiches while the goalkeeper eats perfectly calibrated uh, nutrient rich food. That's essentially what we've done. So is it any one thing? It's no one thing, but it's all those things. Okay, and the next question is, uh, would you agree that creating access to biomedical research careers can be an effective public health intervention by creating a pathway to the middle class mm -hmm. and providing useful knowledge? Yeah, I think it's a great question, actually. I, um, I can think of many, many things much worse than creating um, a pathway to the middle class through research careers. I actually think, uh, I think it's a fantastic question. I think if we in the health research establishment, to use that term, can be part of creating sustainable employment and livable wages for, for people, I think the world is better served by that. There, there is a, a question uh, that, that challenges the notion that correlation does not mean causation. So how can we draw conclusions about the race or, and or income differences in health outcomes that you showed and others have shown uh, as um, as being uh, in the causal path pathway, so to speak. Sure. Yeah, no, it's a great, it, it, look, it's, it, it's an excellent question. And of course, to do that, we'd have to do a different talk about the methods that are used for many of the studies I talked about, talk about the longitudinal data that shows that, talk about moving us beyond the a uh, reductionist view of linear determinism to move towards a complex systems uh, view of the world that really understands how health is produced. So all of that I think we can do. But fundamentally, I would argue that when you look at the literature, there is more evidence for the production of health through many of the exogenous forces I talked about. By exogenous, I mean sort of above the skin than there is for many of the endogenous forces that we focus so much of our attention to. And I, and I, I want to be very clear that my call is for the same level of rigor, of science and scholarship applied to forces exogenous as we do for endogenous. This is, I, by identity, I'm a scientist. And by identity, I, I want the same lens applied to all of it. So I, when I use my soccer analogy at the end, if I may, I don't want, differential treatment for the goalie or for the other 10 players. So you want to make sure that we actually study all of them. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. The, the one more question? question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. this will be the last one. Um, so is the solution to these health inequities uh, to invest money in social services? I think in part it is. I think the solution in part is strengthening the social safety net. I think in part is changing the conversation on health. I think in part it is understanding COVID this lens. I think in part is paying attention to groups that have that are have not, so that those have have not gaps do not become health have and health have health have not gaps. So I want to just close with a, a big big thank you, Sandra. This was magnificent uh, as I've uh, learned to uh, learn so much from you every time that that, that you present an organized thought. Um, and really leave us with uh, just two final uh, messages. One is uh, that these factors are fundamental in determining health and health care, and that all scientists, all clinicians need to consider them. As you pointed out, we're scientists, and we need to give them equal, equal relevance as we do uh, all the other things in biology and in clinical medicine. Um, and, and then the last point would be we live in a society that is a capitalist society that by its very nature generates inequality. And, but it is the only economic system that really generates enough wealth for uh, us to make progress. And sort of our role often is to manage those inequalities and try to mitigate them uh, as we move forward and make progress across the country. So I, I know you don't, you don't say we should all live a panacea. There are gonna be differences uh, by, uh, by different populations. And uh, 
but we just can't uh, continue to tolerate this increasing inequality that uh, you so clearly uh, outlined for us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure.